third day of this chapter, we're looking at 5.7 now, and now we're reversing the process. Now we're going to integrate some of these inverse trig, or problems that are going to give us inverse trig results. And there's really no, this is going to be painful. And the reason it's going to be painful is because you've got to make some recognitions here. And there are some things that you're just, aren't going to make sense off the bat. Um, but what I want you to understand is, when you go back and you look at what we did on some of these previous days, uh, right here, where we were taking some of these derivatives, here's, number two is the derivative of an arc secant function. Uh, and it ended up like, like that blue box. Number three, we did the derivative of an arc tangent function, and it ended up being um, this, this 1 over 1 plus x squared thing. Um, in number... Uh, five, we did the derivative of an arc sine function, and it ended up looking like what's inside that green box. So we're, we've already sort of proved how these things are going to work, but now what we're going to do is we're going to kind of put a, a pattern on it. There's three theorems that we're going to kind of use in this particular class, arc sine, arc tangent, and arc secant. Those are going to be the three results that you're going to get or that we're going to specifically look for. And what you're going to have in each of these is you're going to have a format that you're going to look at. Now I want to look at problem number one before I get into these theorems and I want to show you why you need problem, why you need this. So when I look at problem number one, my first thought would be I should do a u substitution. u should be 4 minus x squared because I've got that quantity inside. du would be negative 2x dx but I don't have this x dx anywhere in the problem. And since I don't have that x dx anywhere in the problem, I'm going to kind of be out of luck. We're going to need a last resort. And this is our pretty much our ultimate last resort here. Uh, this is one of the last derivative or uh, anti-derivative techniques that we're going to learn. And that is, when in doubt, if you can't do the power rule, you can't change it to, to be able to do the power rule, you can't do u substitution, is it possible that it fits one of these three formats that we have up here? Now, some background on what we have. So this, this thing didn't work. We're out of luck there. We can't do u-substitution. Since we can't do u-substitution, here's some background on what we've got going up here. First off, u is a function of x. Okay, u is going to be some sort of a function that we're going to be dealing with. A is a constant. So in every one of these things that we have set up, you'll see an A and you'll see a U. And what I want to do is I want to point out some, some differences. First off, two of them have a radical in what's given to them. So when I look at problem number one, I know it's not the middle one because I, I see no radical in that middle one. So I'm looking at the square root of the quantity, 4 minus x squared. Well, notice. A, our constant, is being squared. A, our constant, being squared. A, our constant, being squared. U, our function of x, being squared. U, our function of x, being squared. U, our function of x, being squared. And oh, look, there's two of them over here in the secant one. Now, the way I kind of keep these straight is I look, I've got sine, tangent, and secant. What is the simplest trig function out of all of those? I would definitely say sine. And that is how this is going to kind of play out. So when I look at problem number one, I see a radical. So I'm looking at, if u substitution didn't work, I'm looking at either an arc sine or over on the far right, an arc secant. So I'm feeling like this time, oh, wait, the constant is in front of the variable. Arc sine, the constant comes first. Arc secant, the, the function comes first. And the way I keep it straight is a lot of people, when they start looking at this thing, will see, oh, look, there's two U's, and they're right next to each other. That's the secant one. Well, the other one, the U's not in the front, the U's in the back. So we know that, the, that we're going to kind of reverse that a little bit. So here's what I know. I recognize this thing, and I look. I see a constant 4. Well, that 4 says that my A is the number 2, because 2 is being squared. I also see that I've got uh, a U... That would be the same thing as x, because that x is being squared. Well, now, this is kind of like a little mini substitution going on in this problem. We want to write this problem using all u's now and a's now instead of x's. So du 
would be the same thing as my dx. So rewrite your integral. What's this look like now? Well, what do I have? I know I've got a 1 on the top. That didn't change. I know I've got a radical on the bottom. That didn't change. But this time, I've got 2 that's being squared. And I've got u that's being squared. And I've been able to rewrite the entire problem all in terms of u. So what do I have? This looks like it fits that first descriptor. When it fits the first descriptor, your result is going to be, well, let's see, arc sine. Arc sine, arc tangent, arc secant. Arc tangent and arc secant both have a 1 over a in front of them. Arc sine doesn't. Again, sine's the simplest trig function. Doesn't have some of the extra things the others do. So this is going to be an arc sine of, it's like parentheses, u over a. Well, what's u? u is your x. a is your 2. Don't forget your C. Now, is that kind of foreign to you right now? Yeah, I, I would bet it's very foreign to you right now. But what we've got is we've got some patterns here, and as you do these a little bit better or a little bit more, you're going to get used to them, and you're going to start to recognize them. Like when you look at problem number two, I would hope that you could recognize right now. You, I've got a variable outside the radical on the bottom. I've got a variable that comes first inside the radical. This looks like it fits the secant form. So I've kind of got in the back of my mind that I'm feeling like this is a secant. Now, can we represent everything? Yeah, I'm thinking I see an a here. I think that a is 8. That 8's being squared. I'm seeing a u. Well, that u, what's being squared? Well, a lot of people will look on the outside of the radical and go, u is going to be x. Well, is that x what's being squared in this first term? And the answer is no. It looks like 2x is being squared. So then my du is going to be 2 dx, and the dx that's in the problem would be exactly the same as 1 half of my du. So let's see if we can rewrite this problem to make everything work. So I've got integral. I've got a 1 on the top. I've got a square root on the bottom with a minus in the middle of it. Well, let's see. What's being squared? Looks like now, according to this, if we rewrote it, we could say u is being squared because u is 2x. We could say a is being squared because a is 8. Well, actually, maybe, you know what, how about instead of me putting u right here, how about if I put the quantity 2x right here? And then out here, this has to be a u. Well, in order for that to be a u, we have to have a 2 in front of the x that was already given to us. Well, here's what's interesting. We have to take care of this uh, dx that's in the problem. That dx that's in the problem, I have to replace it with a 1 half of a du. So if I put a du right there, what a great time to put another 2 instead of outside the integral to put it inside the integral. So now I've got it in the form u square root u squared minus a squared on the bottom. And now this is an arc secant problem. So how does arc secant go? Arc secant starts with 1 over a. So let's throw in a 1 over what's a? a is an 8 times my arc secant of this quantity. And what's my quantity? OK, so now my quantity this time, and then plus my c, absolute value of u. So in this case, absolute value of our 2x. And on the bottom, we have an 8. So yes. A little bit more complex, a lot of things to keep track of. But there's the difference in number one and number two. Number one, the constant came first in the square root. That's an arc sine. Number two, the constant came second in the square root, and we had an extra variable out in front that we could manipulate to turn into a u. That's your arc secant. Three and four. All right, so number three, I see no square root. If I see no square root, chances are if the u substitution and all that fun stuff doesn't work, which if you do a u substitution, you're going to be out of luck here if you, with the whole denominator. This is going to be an arc tangent problem. So arc tangent, I'm going to try to do this and keep it on the screen. I see a constant that's being squared. My constant is going to be 3. I see a u that's being squared. My u is 2x minus 3. So my du is going to be 2 dx's. So let's rewrite this integral. If we rewrite this integral, I've got the integral of 1 over quantity, if 
By the way, the other dead giveaway that's a tangent is the two terms on the bottom are being added together. So I've got 3 being squared plus I've got u being squared. <coughs> now I have to put a du into this problem. But du, the dx that was in the problem originally, is the same thing as half of a du. So I need to throw in a 1 half when it's time to throw in the du. There is definitely the thing that fits my arctangent rule. So arctangent, we had a green 1 half because of, the use of, because of how we rewrote the problem. Now we're ready to use our formula. So that formula says 1 over, whoops, sorry, that formula says 1 over a arctangent of a quantity plus my c. Well, what's, one, what's a in this problem? a is 3, so that 3 goes there and there. And what's my u? My u is my 2x minus my 3. So there's kind of a, we're working our way through it. So now you've seen each one of them in action. Now let's come down to number 4 and let's see if we can recognize what we have. Okay, first thing I'm going to look at with number four is we've got, we've got some differences. I see a square root, so I don't think it's going to be an arc. Well, wait a minute. Maybe I should try u substitution. If I did a u substitution, because I'm getting quantity inside, I got, wait a minute, I got multiple terms on the top. My u substitution I don't think is going to work. So then is it arc sine? Is it arc secant? What exactly? Wait a minute. You know what we should probably do is we should probably go all the way back to the beginning of doing integrals. When we first started doing integrals, my question for everybody was always, how many terms do you see? Well, there's two terms on the top. Well, if there's two terms on the top, I'm going to save some steps here. If we did a u substitution, du is equal to negative 2x dx. Do we have the x dx in the problem? Well, kind of, because there's an x right here and there's a dx right there. So I don't know what I'm supposed to do with the 7. If we looked at it a, differently, a different way, if we said, uh, this was an arc sine. If we said it was an arc sine, what do we do with that extra x? Well, this one, because there are two terms, we are going to look at it as kind of a hybrid. There are two terms in the numerator, so I'm going to write this as two separate integrals. That's not a foreign thing. We've done that before, but in the second integral, I'm going to pull the 7 out of it right away. So now, if I go through and I try to figure out what's going to happen with this thing, my first integral, I've done that before. In fact, I had just gotten done doing this work. I'd already written it. I kind of wrote it twice in this problem. So my x dx that's in the problem would be the same thing as negative 1 half of my du. So I can do that first integral. That one actually is a pretty easy one. What I really have is the integral of negative 1 half integral uh, I've got a u on the bottom that's got a square root. I've got an x dx that's been represented by the one-half du. I think I'm feeling like this is an, uh, a u to the negative one-half power, or a u to the negative one-half power. So that first integral I can do. The second integral, well, let's see. I have a number being squared. A could be 1. I have a u that's being squared. And du would be dx, so I don't have to throw anything extra in the problem. The a comes first, the u comes second. This is an arc sine problem that we're going to work toward. So if I, if I want to deal with this one, uh, what I'm going to see here, let's see that 7 is a constant. So I'm going to bring that 7 down as its own constant. Uh, How does this work? Arc sine doesn't have anything in front. It uh, doesn't have anything that it throws out in front. Arc sine of my fraction u over a plus my c. What's my u? My u is an x. My a is a 1. So it's going to end up being an arc sine of an x. And then when I throw in this other term, I've got negative 1 half times add 1 to the power, u to the 1 half, multiplied by 2. I'm going to have to throw in a plus c, but I'll get that in a minute. 2's cancel. Negative square root of 1 minus x squared minus 7 arc sine of x plus c. <clears throat> so problem number four 
Is it an arc sine? Is it a U substitution? Yeah, yeah, it's both. You've got two separate terms treated as two separate integrals, and if you treat those integrals separately, it's manageable. If you try to treat them together, it's darn near impossible. So there's your antiderivatives with some, arc, you know, some inverse trig functions.